Next person you probably know is Arun Thomas, who's chairing our software task group. He's a principal specialist at Draper Labs, and he's going to tell us a little bit about building system with his five and Rust. Also very exciting. Over here. Um, hi, I'm Maroon Thomas. Um, my talk is titled Building Secure Systems Using Risk V and Rust. Um, so here's a roadmap for my talk. Um, I will talk about building secure systems. Um, my take, as you might expect from uh, the title of my talk, is that uh, Risk V and Rust are uh, a good foundation for building um, secure computer systems. Um, so in particular, um, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, risk, if you use Risk Five and Rust, that all your security problems will go away. But I think it does provide a good foundation. Um, so, in particular, the uh, the advantages of Risk Five hardware, or the openness, simplicity, and flexibility, provides a good platform for uh, doing your hardware um, to, for building secure hardware. And our Rust software provides um, the safe, you have the safety, performance, and productivity of a, a safe systems language um, that makes your system software much more secure. Um, so how do you build a secure computer system? Um, antivirus, I would say, is not the answer. Um, so just putting endpoint protection or adding some sort of security product on top is not the right way to go. Um, you can ask Project Zero about this. Uh, the Google folks have made a sort of a, a career out of breaking endpoint protection systems to like hilarious effect. Um, so instead, you need to uh, design security um, as you, security needs to be a first-class design constraint. It needs to pervade, uh, permeate your whole design process. Um, and in particular, um, security, securing computer systems is complicated because you, security spans all the layers in your system. So the hardware, operating systems, programming languages, applications, all of the layers in your system. Um, so a flaw in any layer um, can compromise your system's security requirements. Um, and in particular, uh, flaws in lower layers are even more serious. Um, so how are we doing? Um, it turns out as an industry, uh, security is hard, right? I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, we've, heard number, we've seen a number of these new attacks on hardware, speculative execution attacks, things like Heartbleed. It's very challenging to secure computer systems, um, especially since we're building on legacy technologies. Um, so can we do better? Um, I believe we can. Um, I think in the 21st century, we can start looking beyond these legacy technologies. I think we can start uh, looking at things like RISC-V and Rust and use that to build a secure foundation for building uh, hardware secure systems in the 21st century. Um, and I'll talk more about what the advantages of RISC-V and Rust are. Um, so first, I'll talk about RISC-V. We're at the RISC-V workshop, so of course I'm going to plug uh, RISC-V for doing uh, secure systems. Um, so risk five, as we've heard in the last couple of days, is opening up the hardware ecosystem. Um, having a simple, open, customizable ISA is a big deal. Um, so there's no more homegrown, custom, bespoke ISAs. Um, everyone can kind of standardize on the one ISA that's supposed to span everything. Uh, you might remember Krista's goal to have this one ISA that spans all computing devices. Um, and we can all work together on standardizing interfaces for extensions that we need. Um, and we're seeing a lot of uh, open hardware implementations now. So we, saw, we heard about the low risk pulp, Chips Alliance, and the open hardware group. So you're starting to see a number of open uh, RISC-V implementations. So this is great. Um, and so by having this open ISA and these open hardware implementations, um, industry and academia can collaborate more effectively. Um, so you don't need any NDAs. Um, you just need to clone a Git repo, and we can all work together collectively in solving these problems. And I think this is critical for making progress in solving hard security problems. Um, in particular, things like Spectre and Meltdown won't just happen. Like one company isn't going to solve that. We as an industry need to work together. And having these open ISA and open hardware is uh, important to uh, solving this problem. Um, so this is a, a quote from a RISC-V Foundation statement. I think it was really sort of after Spectre and Meltdown. I kind of like the quotes so I included in the talk. Um, it says, the RISC-V community has a historic opportunity to do security right from the get-go with the benefit of up-to-date knowledge. So I think we, if we all work together, we can solve some of these problems by uh, leveraging these, the open ISA and the open implementations, but there's a lot of work to do, and it will require, it will require all of us. So that's sort of a call to action for all of us. 
Um, so RISC V is sort of becoming a, the kind of de facto platform for security research. Um, the center of mass is starting to shift. Um, there's several groups exploring new security ideas on RISC V. There's folks working on tagged architectures, like my group, uh, hardware-enforced capabilities, formally verified RISC V implementations, secure enclaves. There's also a bunch of interesting work going on in the, that you'll see in the security session that is right after the break. Um, my colleague Chris Casino will talk about some of the work we're doing um, at my employer. Um, and so I think like there's a lot of pretty interesting stuff happening on RISC V uh, on Rust, and uh, I think it'll sort of continue as people start doing more research on our RISC V. Um, so why is Rust interesting from a security perspective? Um, I'll, first, I'll start talking about systems programming. Um, so this is a quote from James Mickens. He's a professor at Harvard now. He used to be a researcher at Microsoft. And so I'll read out the quote. It says, a systems programmer has seen the terrors of the world and understood the intrinsic horror of existence. Um, so I think this is true. You see some gnarly stuff when you're doing systems programming, when you're, when you're working in kernel code and like in low-level systems. Um, I recommend the whole article. It's hilarious. Um, so why is system software challenging? Um, so a lot of the challenges have to do with you doing low-level system software. You're programming without a net. Um, you, the software has, is critical to enforcing security, safety requirements. Um, there aren't particularly great debugging tools. So, and you're working on things like operating systems, hypervisors, runtimes, drivers, firmware, browsers, and web servers. So this is you know, kind of like low-level system software. Um, and typically, this code is written in C and C++ for performance. Um, the problem with that is that C and C++ are not memory safe, so you see a lot of these memory uh, errors. You see crazy kernel panics and things like that. Um, you see memory corruption vulnerabilities, um, and these are often exploited. Um, a recent Microsoft study has estimated that 70% of their security bugs are due to memory safety issues, so this is, this is a real problem. Um, but we can do better. I mean, so systems typically, uh, system software is still mostly written in C, um, some C++ as well. Um, it turns out that programming languages have evolved in the last 50 years. Programming languages researchers have done a lot of work, and uh, Rust is sort of a distillation of some promising ideas from programming language research into a production, a productive production language. Um, so Rust is a safe performance systems programming language. So the thing that's cool about it is it's low level enough to do systems programming, um, but high level enough. It has a lot of the, the memory safety and productivity of a high level language. So it's actually a, a nice platform for writing system software. Um, so Rust originates at Mozilla. Um, it was originally created by Mozilla Research. Um, the initial use case for Rust was uh, developing experimental, uh, an experimental browser engine called Servo. Um, and Mozilla is actually using this. Um, if you're using Firefox today, um, you're using Rust code. Um, so Mozilla began shipping Rust components in Firefox 48 in uh, 2016. Um, and Mozilla has this process that they call oxidization, where they are rusting out components. I think that's clever. Um, I like the term. Um, and Rust code has actually improved Firefox's security and performance. So with respect to security, uh, they're looking at rewriting parsers and Rust to prevent vulnerabilities. Um, for instance, they have a new MP4 metadata parser that replaced lib stage fright. Uh, you might recall the stage fright vulnerability from a couple of years ago. That was pretty serious. Um, so Rust is actually improving the safety of uh, Firefox. It's also improving the performance. So they were able to rewrite a new parallel uh, cascading style sheet engine that speeds up page loads um, because Rust has very nice support for concurrency and uh, it protects you from doing uh, for, from data races and things like that. Um, so the nice thing about Rust, as I mentioned, is that uh, it's a systems programming language, but you get some of the nice toys that the uh, higher, level programming, higher level language programmers get. Um, so performance is on par with C++. And C++. Uh, you get memory safety without the overhead of garbage collection, which is important in some applications, particularly embedded um, and some networking applications and kernel. Um, so the programmer still has fine-grained control over memory. Um, Rust also provides thread safety. This is what the Rust people call fearless concurrency. So you don't have the concurrency bugs and data races associated with multi-threaded code. Um, and the way this works is Rust has a powerful type system that enforces memory and thread safety at compile time. So if your code compiles, you have a good confidence that it's going to work and not have any of these bugs. Um, it also really has a really good development environment. So it is an excellent package manager and generally really good tools, um, more so than, much more so than uh, legacy systems languages. Um, and so because of these advantages, Rust is gaining popularity in the systems community. Um, so you're seeing Rust-based operating systems. Uh, the talk microcontroller OS is particularly interesting. Uh, there's also Redox, Intermezzos, and some others. 
Um, Amazon and Google have developed Rust-based virtual machine monitors, um, cross VM and Firecracker. Uh, the core boot developers I learned yesterday are exploring a Rust rewrite. They're calling it Orboot. So it's a fork of core boot with C removed. So I thought that was amusing. Um, and then there are a number of projects exploring uh, Rust OS components for the Linux kernel, the FreeBSD kernel, SEL4, and Fuchsia OS. Um, so the nice thing about Rust is that it has good interoperability with C and C++, so you don't have to rewrite your full system, you can actually just rewrite parts of it. So this is also something that we're um, exploring on my team. Um, so what's the status of Rust on RISC-V? There's been a lot of progress in the last, uh, couple, last year. Um, so there is now support for 32-bit uh, RIS, uh, Rust RISC-V support uh, for bare metal. This went in late last year. And just one a month ago, uh, there's now a bare metal support for RB64. Um, so if you want to do bare metal hacking on Rust, you can do that now. Um, there is a handy quick start template for doing bare metal RISC-V development. Um, you can target the High Five One. I think you can target the Kendrite board, and you can also target QMU. Um, you can grab this link and start playing with stuff. Um, it includes several example projects. You can do, you know, Hello World to UR and blink some LEDs and things like that. Um, and if you want more details on this, you can check out my Oxidize 19 talk. Um, so, what about OS targets? What if you don't? What if you actually want to run an operating system? Um, so, Linux RV64 is up next. Um, we don't have support. It's sort of in progress. Um, this is, as you've heard from other talks, is important for Linux distributions and for the uh, Firefox ports, since Firefox uses Rust now. Um, so I'm hoping we can kind of gather people um, from the community to work on this. Um, there's a software meeting uh, tomorrow uh, during the foundation day. I hope we can talk about Rust and other things, um, coordinating on you know, bringing up Linux and stable distributions and LVM and all that stuff. But I'm definitely interested in talking more about Rust as well. Um, the, there's a talk, Microcontroller OS Port in Progress. The talk is this. Uh, OS kernel that's written in Rust, and it provides a, a secure foundation for IoT devices. I'm pretty enthusiastic about talk for uh, building these kinds of uh, systems. Um, so yeah, I think uh, overall, like the Rust RISC-V uh, ecosystem is coming a long way. Um, there's more work to do. I hope you'll kind of uh, help flesh that out. Um, and yeah, I think RISC-V and Rust provide a strong foundation for building secure systems. You have the safety, performance, productivity of Rust, and the openness, simplicity, and flexibility of RISC-V. And together, I think they provide a strong foundation for building secure systems. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. Thanks. Do you have questions? Yeah. Almost. Uh, hey, so my question is, uh, what changes uh, do you do to the core that you use RISC-V? Or it is just you use, RIS, uh, you use Rust to write the firmware. Because the way w we discussed it uh, in 2017 during the birth of Feather room at FOSDEM for Rust, and uh, then at least my perception from, like my idea was essentially make hardware acceleration for the fact that Rust allows you to have safe, unsafe, and so on, that you can distinguish when you dereference a raw pointer to memory. So just, just you know, my perception was the moment we have unsafe, that actually, let's say, triggers a bit flip, and, and you switch the mode of the CPU, you know? It, it sounds a bit crazy, but still, you know, the fact that you can actually have a, 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 a CPU, the reason we use C, it's not because it's the best, it's because it's the most natural language to interface with hardware nowadays. And, and if we have RISC-V, which is open ESA and so on, we can have a way to, to, to adjust the, 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 the CPU to the language, so it's native. Because currently, to me, when we write uh, firmware in Rust for, let's say, STM, which is done, uh, it's, it's, it, it's not natural. It, it, you, just, you, you just rewrite the firmware, but it's not actually it, for the CPU. It's, it's, it's like you have indirect uh, access, you have peripherals which are concurrent naturally. So, <laughs> you know, all of this, is this about actually making a new core that is essentially Rust acceleration core that you actually take advantage of the Rust as a, as a, as a, as a design concept, how you, how you design your programs, or is just use your, write your firmware in Rust and run it on the core? So my, my talk is just about Rust in general, but I think uh, hardware software co-design is definitely interesting. So I think the ideas that you talked about would be, we, you have the freedom to do that, obviously. You have these open implementations, and you could do things to protect unsafe code. So 
I think that's interesting. Um, it's not something I'm exploring right now, but because uh, the reason we keep we keep using C, it's not because it's the best. It's because the best way to interact with the hardware and describe what the hardware we want to do. We need to write a register that doesn't take much, right? And then you have a peripheral that's doing something awesome. So it, it's just native. It's just easier. So I would argue Rust has the uh, the primitives that you need to do that as well. Um, yeah. We but can then taking the next step, what's wh how do you make the incentive for people to learn something new? to switch? I don't know. I think you make it fun. I mean, I think the Rust language is pretty fun to work on. You make it productive. I mean, I think that's partially why the core boot folks are looking at it. They found that, I think uh, Ron said that they were able to get kind of like the basic functionality of core boot written in like 300 lines. So I think you, I think the reason why Rust is taking off is people are seeing the, uh, the I mean, the security um, improvements from having like safe code, and also you're seeing the productivity improvements as well. Um, writing in Rust is much easier than writing in, I mean, it's much nicer than writing in C, right? You have much better tooling, you have a much better compiler, you have lots of libraries. Um, Brian Kentrell talked about this in some of his blog posts. Um, he's a Solaris developer and joint developer. So I think in general, you like, you can't force it down someone's throat, but you make it a productive environment. And the same way, the same way we had TensorFlow on GPU. Sorry, thanks, Arun. We'll have to transition okay. to the post. We can talk offline. Question.